So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You might notice I'm not Sir Robin Jacob. Um, my name is Roland Mallinson. Uh, I'm on the executive committee of Marx. Uh, I'm also actually chairing our uh, Brexit task force uh, for Marx. Uh, and I'm here tonight because uh, I, I uh, help work with Robin to, to arrange the, the evening. Um, Robin is actually en route back from uh, Astana, 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 which is, um, for those who don't know, in Kazakhstan. Uh, he has landed, I'm pleased to say. Uh, he's in a taxi. Uh, I did propose, actually, because I wasn't particularly keen to sit here and do this introduction and start the process without him, but uh, I should say that I recommended he take a, a motorbike taxi, but he didn't take up my <laughs> offer. Uh, I even volunteered to pay for it, but he still wouldn't take up my <laughs> offer. So he's sitting in a taxi somewhere in Hammersmith. He will be here in about 10 minutes or so, but I will, kick, I, I will get the, uh, the process started. Um, uh, I also actually uh, often start the, uh, th this event um, with a plea on behalf of Marx. Uh, some of you have heard this before, but I am also involved in the Amicus Curiae team at Marx. Uh, and we, uh, and Marx, the European Trademark Owners Association, uh, will uh, support um, brand owners in cases where we are invited to do so. We also take part, even if we're not invited sometimes, if we think it's... Uh, are uh, useful on behalf of brand owners generally. These are cases going to, in particular, the Court of Justice. And so my annual plea is, if you do have a case uh, where you think you would like to have the benefit of Mark's uh, uh, Amicus Curiae team uh, putting in a submission in support of your case, then just let us know. If you go to the Mark's website, you can find our Amicus team and you can contact the chair of the team. Uh, and uh, we can then have a discussion to see whether we can be of, uh, of use to you. And we've been involved in some cases uh, recently, for example, the Red Bull case, uh, which is uh, in general court last year. I was arguing that, and we've got that coming up again uh, in the Court of Justice. Uh, I'm not yet clear whether I'm going to be allowed to plea, uh, because it depends whether it's before or after Brexit. We'll see. Um, so, tonight, let me introduce our judges. I'm delighted to say we've got an excellent panel for this evening, and I hope we'll have a lively discussion. Uh, so, uh, on my left here, we have uh, Her Honour Judge Melissa Clark. Uh, Melissa uh, sits as a Deputy High Court Judge, so she, we've seen a few of her decisions uh, at the IPEC. Um, uh, I, I'm delighted, actually, I can make this introduction. Uh, Melissa was an old colleague of mine, uh, a link lady, many years ago. Uh, she's the only judge who's managed to get in two lines. I just got to quote these from you, for you, for, for a case. Uh, how often do you get this opportunity in a judgment to say, dogs eat, they do not dine, uh, and the one is, the dog is not a party to the proceedings, which is great. Um, she's also had cases about tattoo artists and you name it. So I hope we'll hear some lively stories from, um, from Melissa. Uh, then also on my left, I have uh, Judge Octavia Spinial metai I hope I'm pronouncing something vaguely right there. Um, uh, she is from Romania. She has been a judge at all levels from Romania in the Court of Appeal and at the High Court of Cassation in Romania. She is now a judge on the General Court and has been uh, for uh, about two years, since September 2016. She's been involved in many cases on trademarks, um, color marks, 3D shape marks. Uh, I like this case. Uh, actually, this was a revocation case involving three trademarks, an ideal husband, an ideal wife, an ideal lover. Um, so maybe we'll hear about that. Uh, uh, yes, well indeed. So that was an interesting case. Then on my right, I have Dame uh, Vivian Rose, Mr. Justice Rose. Um, she uh, started life uh, as, a, as, a, as a barrister in domestic and EU competition law. She then went on to be a government advisor uh, and also an advisor to the Speaker of the House of Commons, I think. Uh, she has been a judge in the High Court Chancery Division since 2013 uh, and has been involved in another champagne case as, uh, as, as Melissa was involved in Verb Pico, uh, Dame Vivian Rose in, uh, in a case involving uh, Cristal. Uh, she's had a number of other interesting cases, Flynn Farmer and Assos, amongst others. Uh, Harry Salmi on my right here has come in from Alicante. He's from the EUIPO Board of Appeal. He's been at the EUIPO for 23 years. Uh, he started life as a lawyer in Finland. Um, it is true that he would have done slightly more cases than all the others put together yes. because he's uh, um, going through them at a, at a lick of about 130 a year, I think I was hearing, which is quite good going. He's also been involved in 3D case shapes, uh, uh, biscuits, I think, uh, coffee percolators, and he also made the original first instance decision in the Thailand case, Blue Bottle. Uh, and I reminded him that he was actually upheld on appeal for that. So uh, he'd, he'd almost forgotten that. So 
Those is our panel, so uh, I'm delighted that we will welcome them, and I hope we'll have an interesting question. So I've got a series of questions here. Uh, I've got to make sure that the ones I do, I tick off so that Robin doesn't ask them uh, again when he comes in through the door. Um, I'm going to start with a, a sort of non-specific one about trademarks, though. Uh, how much training uh, do you get to be a judge in your, in your position, and is it an ongoing training? Uh, and I thought we'd start with that one with Octavia, because Octavia's been a judge from the year after she graduated, which is somewhat different to how our other judges will have got to their current position. So, Octavia. Uh, yes, uh, I'm a judge since uh, January 91. Uh, and uh, in Romania, it is possible uh, to become a judge at a very uh, early stage of your life. Uh, it's the same system like in um, many other countries, like France, Italy, Spain, Portugal. Uh, now it, it's obligatory after the law school to, to graduate also the National Institute for Judiciary, but at that time this institute uh, didn't exist. So to become a judge in Romania, you have to graduate uh, the law school and then the institute. To become a judge at the general court, because I think you are more interested in this uh, topic, uh, is not uh, um, obligatory to have been before a judge in your um, country. So my colleagues uh, at the general court are judges coming from various other uh, professions. There are professors of uh, law, there are lawyers, uh, there are uh, former uh, agents working for different uh, uh, European institutions, and some of them are career judges. An interesting statistic in our discussion earlier, without being too precise, roughly how many do you think are actually academics on the general court and how many are from history and how many are judges? Do you give us a vague figure? I think that former, former judges, career judges are, are probably a quarter, a third. So that's interesting. So more than half of our general court judges are, sort of have an academic background. Uh, yes, or, or they uh, have been lawyers before. Right. Ad advocates in, in this sense. Okay. <laughs> because lawyers, I think, cover everything which is related to, to law school. Do you want to fill us in on the UK? Yes, of course, people join the judiciary at the end of their career rather than at the beginning or partway through their, their career. The height of it, I think. The, the height of their career, quite <laughs> right. And um, there is more training now than there has been in the past, particularly for judges uh, in their first judicial post, because most judges take on a fee-paid role before they move to a salaried full-time post. And the, and the training tends to be a mixture of uh, judge craft, which is the aspects of the job which are generic to any topic of law that you, you're going to cover, how to conduct a hearing, uh, judgment writing, um, those sorts of, of skills. The uh, training on subject matter is rather more sporadic and um, there's no, I didn't have any particular training on IP uh, law before I joined or after I joined the um, Chancery Division and so most judges training when they um, are faced with a case in a topic that they don't know anything about or they haven't come across before the training is really provided by the advocates who present the case and who we're very fortunate, they are generally very skilled at pitching the way in which they present the case to the, to the judge um, on the basis of what they know about the judge's expertise or lack of it in that area of the law. We, while we're on the UK, should we just say, Melissa, more, slightly more recent judge since? Um, yes, well, we do have something now called the Judicial College, mm. which um, uh, puts out a prospectus basically every year, and everyone has to choose some training to go to. Uh, and that's mostly judge led training. So it's uh, judges teaching other judges, and it's sort of small discussion groups and, and learning really by experience from each other. So there is uh, training out there, but I must say there isn't any specialist training for intellectual property even in the judicial college. And Harry, the EU IPO, I dare say that you're doing this all the time in a way. Yeah. <laughs> Internal training or something? Uh, well, yes and no. I mean, basically to become a member of the Boards of Appeal, um, the basic criteria is that you have to have 10 years of experience of working in the area of IP and five of those in the areas of trademarks. 
we don't then really have any specific training as such for the members when they come in. We have two types usually. One is, like myself, somebody who has worked within the office for many years. In other words, your training is that you've been doing this at first instance level, writing decisions like you would be doing in the, in the Boards of Appeal, a different format, but basically the same thing. Um, so uh, we would have been doing that, um, like in my case, for around 10 years. Uh, and then uh, the other type is people coming from the outside. Uh, there you have some people who have actually worked in national courts, have been judges at national courts. We have people who have been on the other side, uh, worked on the other side, in other words, are, are, are from the uh, private sector, trademark, uh, in trademark agents and so on. So we have quite a diverse uh, group of people. Uh, you don't even necessarily have to be a lawyer. Uh, we do have one, uh, one of our members who is, by her training, she's an architect. But okay. she has worked in the area of trademarks for around 20 years. And, uh, and also, one of the, she, for example, also sits on our designs board, which is very useful as somebody who really understands something about technical matters. Um, but in the actual decision making, the rule is that um, as we are a panel of three, at least two of them have to be legally trained. Okay, thank you. Um, next question, actually, probably less directed to certainly Harry, who, who, who gets this is your daily diet of work, but to our other judges who are not getting trademark cases so regularly. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, what's your reaction when you see on your list of cases a, a trademark case? Do you sort of go, oh dear, or, or actually are you uplifted and thinking, no, this will be interesting? So, um, Vivian, would you like to start on that? The, the trademark cases I've done have all been fascinating. Uh, and having a competition law background myself, I did have some contact, obviously, with intellectual property um, in that sphere. And the thing that I really enjoy about competition law is also perhaps shared with um, trademark law in that you get to have quite a close look at a particular product or a particular industry and see how that product is presented to the public, to the consumer, uh, and that, that is something I, I find very interesting. My experience was that the, the law is very complicated and there are multiple stages that you have to go through for each uh, allegation that's made of infringement or challenge to validity for um, non-use um, and that uh, making sure that you express the test in the right way, you get the feeling coming to it afresh that there are certain technical phrases which are terms of art and which carry a whole lot of baggage and are correctly used in one context but not in another context and that can sometimes um, give the impression to the newcomer that um, you need to be very careful not to fall in some trap of using the correct phrase, the phrase incorrectly. Um, but I did enjoy the cases um, because uh, I suppose I was lucky that the products that I was involved in, cycling gear and champagne and pharmaceuticals, were, were perhaps more interesting than your average widget, I would say. Tavia? I must confess that I'm very happy when I see uh, trademark cases uh, on my list. Um, there are quite many at the level of the general court. Um, I would say that sometimes they are less complicated and less complex than other cases, like uh, competition law cases. <laughs> but sometimes they, they um, um, raise very interesting questions and uh, uh, I always <coughs> something interesting in a, in a trademark case because I, I think that dealing with trademark cases requires not only uh, knowledge but uh, a sort of intuition. Mm -hmm. uh, they are the, at the same time uh, sophisticated uh, involving uh, common sense. Uh, and in order to, I think that in order to, to be a good judge in, in, in this uh, <coughs> field of, uh, of law, uh, you have to, to like and uh, to understand uh, trademarks also in your private life. If you don't, don't like or you do, don't care about trademarks, I don't think that you could get involved with uh, the same uh, uh, strength and passion in, in a trademark case. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, sir. I'm always delighted when I do a trademark case. I think they're, they're often amusing for some reason. Um, the subject matters are so diverse. Um, I have quite a wide jurisdiction. I, I only sit in trademarks four to six weeks a year. Uh, and I can tell you my heart sinks when I see another boundary dispute. Um, so uh, uh, I have uh, all sorts of things in my list, but trademarks uh, are, are generally interesting. They're generally, uh, as Octavia says, um, th there's often um, uh, complexities within them, which uh, is what we look for uh, to retain interest as judges. Uh, they're also the only cases that my non-lawyer friends ever notice and talk to me about, uh, <laughs> because the strange ones get picked up by the <coughs> evening standard for some reason. So it gives me something to talk about as a dinner party. Uh, Harry, do you long for a boundary dispute? Really? Yeah, no, <laughs> um, well, Octavia, you raised an interesting point there about the experience you draw on for your trademark cases. So I suppose an obvious question <coughs> then is um, many of our cases, also, increasingly you see experts being wheeled out um, who, have, um, who are psychologists and, and, and sort of um, uh, marketing experts. Are you persuaded <coughs> by that sort of evidence that you know, this is how a consumer sees... Um, the, the colour red in the context of a supermarket shelf. Do, you, it, do we think that's persuasive, or would you rather just say, well, I, can, I can make my own mind up on this? You, you ask me now to, to make a more uh, hypothetical well, exercise. Well, okay, hypothetical. <laughs> because uh, at the general court, I, I <clears throat> only saw some um, market surveys. Yes. We didn't have so far uh, an expert uh, appearing in front of us and giving an opinion or something like that. So okay. I. But I think that I would be interested to see, and uh, uh, as to the outcome, how much relevance I would give, it depending how convincing it would be. I wonder if what would be the result if both parties uh, would come with uh, uh, very interesting and strong positions uh, on behalf of experts. But in the end, the, the expert in law, and most of the time is a matter of law that we have to solve, must be and remain the judge. Do you have a view on that? Really? Yes, I think. I think there is, in other areas of the law, I know that the courts have recently stamped down on the idea of having expert evidence as to what the reasonable man thinks about things in different areas of the law, and that there are lots of areas where a, a um, construct in the form of a person is posited uh, whose view on one of the issues is considered to be relevant. And I think everybody realises that actually that person is the judge. Um, and I would be sorry to see the encroachment of expertise into areas which, as, as Octavia says, are at the moment dealt with by common sense, which of course all judges feel that they are liberally endowed mm -hmm. with, and, um, and taken out of that realm. Not only because I, I think it's... It's a, it would be the wrong area, the wrong direction for the law to travel in, but it's also then one more area of expense for the parties, which I, th I think is a bit pointless. I've also had survey evidence in, in both the cases that I did, um, both by the same expert, and I, I did find that, that helpful, uh, and I think the law has, has developed to set quite closely the parameters of what is permitted and, and what is not and how those surveys should be conducted. But it, I'd, I'd be sorry to see it develop beyond that, I think. Have you had experts? Well, in IPEC, I think it, experts, sort of psychological yes. experts on the average consumer um, wouldn't survive either the cost-benefit analysis or, or the time limitations that we have. So I've uh, never seen them in IPEC and I, I don't expect to. Um, I'm, I'm not really aware that any expert psychologist's evidence of how consumers make decisions uh, has been before our courts, has it? Has it been before? Well, not, 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 not any of our, our courts. courts. No, I'm not no. sure. Anyone sit here think they've wheeled out yet? Yes. Harry, do you get this sort of ev evidence sometimes? Uh, in, I've had a few in some design cases, but in trademarks I don't really remember. No. No. But just as an example, um, my, uh, my sister, she's a psychologist, and she once asked me because she was looking for interesting subjects to study and, uh, or make, a, make, a, make a, 
to study from a psychological point of view. And she asked me, well, would you have interest in your trademark area to know, you know, what do the, uh, what do the consumers, uh, how do they compare and what do they do? And I said, look, I mean, the thing is that it's not as simple as that. Uh, the law is not as simple as that. I mean, when you talk about likelihood of confusion, it doesn't just mean that, okay, are the consumers confused? It's not such, it's not that simple. And therefore, the usefulness of such a study, from our point of view, is practically nothing. Because, uh, and I told her an example, let's say you have the mark Adidas and you have another mark called Aditas. Are the consumers confused? Usually not, because Adidas is so well known. Um, they will recognize immediately that this is perhaps a copy or whatever. So that in the area of trademarks, there are other factors which you have to take into account, uh, reputation or, or, or distinctness, level of distinctness, and so on. So it's much more, much more complicated than just looking at the consumer. And therefore, I haven't seen them. And as I said, they probably wouldn't have very much influence at all anyway. Okay. Yes, sir. It just comes to mind one new area of, of evidence, which I don't know, I suppose it was expert evidence, was of Google Analytics and this um, evidence as to confusion or dilution and swamping being raised um, by an analysis of how many people have clicked on the, the wrong um, website and what comes up when you put in one search term that um, if, you, if you put in <coughs> one mark as a search term whether uh, websites including the rival sign come up or the rival mark come up um, and I've certainly had evidence uh, about that as being put forward as sort of proxy evidence for how people are confused um, but it has to be looked at quite closely not least because what emerged during the ASOS case was that if the solicitor who's been involved in the case click uh, puts in a search term because they have been working so much on the same computer using the other mark the computer will have learned that 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 they're interested in the other mark and it will assume that that's what they're actually looking for and they've made a typo so so actually the results that are gained from a google search by someone who has been involved in the case may actually be very different from the results which um the judge, if they happen to be Googling, uh, would, would get yes, of course not they wouldn't having do that. No. Looked, at the, looked at either um, mark before. Um, now, Octavia, you raised the issue in a way of how this sort of expert evidence is presented, and it may brings us to these company, the idea of hearings. Um, in the general court, you have a hearing, but the opportunity for experts and cross-examination doesn't exist. In the UK system, we obviously do have that. And Harry in theory doesn't have that so often, but I thought perhaps, Harry, do you want to start us on the idea of hearings and whether or not that can be bring a benefit to the process of, of uh, coming to a just decision? Um, now, as I told Roland earlier, we've actually, I think we've had two oral hearings in 23 years. Uh, we are now going to have one in November. Um, and the reason is practically always that we don't see what uh, additional value uh, would be would be done by it because we are usually talking about things which can be found in documents. Um, so in that sense, we haven't really used it, uh, but we are open to using it. And uh, we, as I said, we have a, a case now coming up in November. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, I can tell you what what it concerns because it's uh, we've made it already public. It concerns the trademark monopoly, which um, uh, there's a cancellation action uh, based on the fact that the appellant claims that uh, uh, monopoly has done various registrations during the years to keep up uh, to to uh, in order to avoid the fact that they would have to uh, provide proof of use. 
a bit of an ironic trademark <laughs> for the concept of obtaining yes. a permanent monopoly. Yes. And there we see the, the value of the fact of, of, of hearing, for example, in this case, uh, monopolies' views of why they have used such a trademark strat strategy. If all of this information would have been available in the documents, then we probably wouldn't have needed it. But in this case, we felt that we don't actually have all the necessary information that we could perhaps have. And has there been a request for disclosure in that process or not? Um, I'm not quite sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and um, Octavia, maybe on, on, on the idea of oral hearings, because your oral hearings are slightly more constrained to some extent than those that Melissa and uh, uh, Mubin is, is getting. We, we have uh, indeed oral hearings uh, in, uh, in trademark cases. Actually, is always an appeal lodged against an, a decision of the Board of Appeal of the, of the office, UIPO. Uh, and uh, theoretically, we could hear uh, experts or witnesses, but it's not the case most of the time. Um, we hear the, the pleas of the lawyers, uh, and uh, that's it's, it's enough to, to to take a decision. L limited to 20 minutes per party is. is uh, at the beginning, uh, each party uh, has 15 minutes actually, uh, but after that is the question time, and uh, we we normally have two hours maybe of debate afterwards. And we review the whole case together with, with the lawyers. It's, yes. So it's not so short and so uh, limited. Would you like the idea of 20 minutes, 15, sorry, 15 minutes uh, per party? Well, we're all addicted to oral hearings in, in England. That's just how, how things have always been done here. And it, in most areas, I think it, it um, fulfills the need if there is a need for some kind of cathartic process by which the, the dispute is resolved. Um, I don't know whether trademark cases are generally less highly charged emotionally than boundary disputes, for example, which are al always extremely highly charged. Um, uh, I would regret the uh, removal of oral hearings, but then I would say that, wouldn't I? Because it's what I've what I've grown up with. Um, the only thing I would say is that uh, quite often I change my mind as to the result um, of the case during the course of the hearing, um, and quite often significant evidence does come out um, from the live witnesses. The number of whether the number of times that that actually changes the result in terms of who wins and who loses makes it worthwhile going through that process in every case. It's is well, there's a PhD topic for um, someone out there to to consider. Well, we can get a bit more technical now. I think. So, um, on some specifics on trademarks. So, um, we've had a number of applications for non-traditional marks uh, in the new digital file option since uh, uh, October. Ah, I'm about to be relieved. <laughs> should we clap? I think we should clap. Yes, thank you, Robin. <laughs> Should I hand over? <laughs> Robin, I... Fine, can I start at a Heathrow? I can get it from Heathrow here. <laughs> Where have we gone? Yeah. You should have taken that motorbike, I didn't tell you to. Um, so we've got to literally number, number eight there, and I've okay. crossed out the ones we've done, and if you start repeating a question I've done, I will, I will tell you. Yes, okay. uh, otherwise, you're in charge now. I'll know if I can get this. Uh, excuse me. Right, here you are. Right. The order of microphone. Yes. There you are. Good. Applications Enjoy. for non-traditional marks using new digital file <laughs> options. One mark is 25 second long video. Now the sound marks in your voice saying one word. Well now then, can you register a film as a trademark? I mean, copyright in films only lasts 70 years or something, like that. a bit 90 probably. Anyway, but you can have a permanent right in Snow White. Or in Gone with the Wind. <laughs> or gone with the Wind. Okay, well will you, let it, will you allow it on in the office? We do now, but um, whether whether you could say whether they actually are trademarks, I think, is open to, be, to, be, to debate. I, 
I've had a look at the 25 second video and I don't advise everyone to do it because it's pretty gory. Um, and it comes from a, a computer game and I, I, I think probably this is where most interest is at the moment at these early stages is in the games industry and, and entertainment. Uh, and it's not, a, it's not a film. I don't think the reason for the 25 seconds isn't the film. It's to show the effect that is the trademark of the game. So if you shoot somebody in the head in this game, um, the skull, the, the outside skin dissolves and it kind of shows the skull and the musculature and it's a kind of horrible way of dying. <laughs> it, it's not the usual sort of blowing up of the head. And the reason it's 25 seconds is because they, they don't, it, it's not copy, it, the issue is not one of copyright because it's not that specific image that's being protected, it's the effect. So they're showing you what it looks like from people being shot in the head from different angles, um, I think four or five times. So what it is, is the, is the game mechanic, which is what they're trying to protect, I think. And so to that extent, I think it's very interesting. Um, it's, it's, it's trying to protect as a trademark, really, the idea behind the mechanic, which of course as an idea would not be protected by copyright. But is it, is it just protected if it were used in another video game, or if someone tried to use it in a feature film, would they? Would the owner of the mark be able to? to yes, stop but well, it? I, I think it. They're saying it's sufficiently distinctive to be a mark showing the origin of the, of the game. And so, if a competitor was to use it, and there's a big overlap anyway, isn't there, between films and and, com and computer games, um, somewhere else, then there would be that argument that. That it's that it's an infringement. I, I didn't see the movie, and I would be reluctant to speak about a certain case, especially because it's at uh, office and could uh, appear in front of us in a while. But uh, what, what is new actually in this uh, new regulation? It's the condition of uh, being uh, the sign being uh, graphically represented, replaced by the condition of being represented. But as to the rest, everything is, is the same. The sign must be distinctive, must be non-descriptive must be able to to work as a indication of the origin so i think that the test remains the same it's, it's mm -hmm. not that with this new possibility to to register the trademark in a, in another uh, manner than gra graphically represented will change the whole philosophy and in terms of the time of the clip well i think the all it says is that it has to be self-contained that, that's a pretty wide envelope isn't it mm -hmm. i think the uh Precise the problem with this trademark um, is the fact that whether it, whether it actually functions as a trademark, mm -hmm. in the sense of uh, does, does the consumer seeing this as an indication of origin? Origin. I have my personal doubts that I don't think that they would. They would just see it as a film. But we again, can, yeah, it's a film by some examples. So if you mm -hmm. think of the Pink Panther walking across the screen you know, as the Pink Panther does. Or if you think about perhaps the James Bond gun and then the naked woman mm -hmm. in the, you know, that, that mm -hmm. image, you see it and you immediately think yeah. of James Bond and you say, I, I'm open certainly to, mm -hmm. to understanding it. But it'll be interesting to see how it's actually used. Does anybody in the audience want to say anything about this? Yes, James. Right. When you were shaking your head, <laughs> um, I was thinking, well, supposing it were a roaring lion, No, I think the art problem is that, 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 that at this application stage, it's not necessarily going to be used as a trademark at all. Mm -hmm. the, the problem is the distinguishing between whether it's being used in a way to indicate origin. Yeah. Well, we well, see Snow White indicates origin, it's Disney. As soon as you see the picture of her, you think yeah. of Disney. Or all of so those. Can they, can they register the whole Snow White? You don't need to, you just need to register Snow White looking Snow white and perhaps doing a little flourish with her dress. Anyway. <laughs> the, the, the other point to that question also was sound marks for, uh, which are simply someone who says the word and that's been registered. And, and, and is it registrable just because someone is saying it, maybe in an unusual accent? Yes. Uh, where the word itself is unregisterable as a written word on the page. Uh, and then you're going to have difficulties of whether that's registrable, and then also what on earth happens in future where someone writes the word on a page and someone tries to assert the sound mark against the word as a written mark. But if it's the sound that makes it distinctive, it wouldn't so be infringed by the written word on the page. 
is like when I ha we have a, a verbal element with an embellishment, uh, figurative embellishment. It's the same. If, if the, yeah. the word is descriptive, in my view, it doesn't matter the way it is pronounced or it appears in written or as, as a sound. So. Hmm. Well, in the old days, we would have a branding because we would have allowed the register well, no, well, should we? That's another question. What do you think? Should we have disclaimers? I can register this word as pronounced, but I can't have I can't have the word. At the moment, no. We don't some countries, some national registries uh, do allow disclaimers. Yeah, but it's only EU countries. Yes, but at, at the EU level, I don't think we have. No. Should we have them? I don't know. There are actually now two orientations. Sometimes there is a tendency uh, in the analysis of the risk of confusion uh, and first of the similarity to disregard the, the descriptive uh, element. Uh, but m most of the time is taken into consideration even if it's uh, just to say that the similarity is weak or the risk of confusion non-existent. But I have to admit that I've seen different uh, approaches. The difficulty with disclaimers is the consumer doesn't know what's been disclaimed either. They just see the whole mark. And so you have to look at distinctiveness yes, exactly. in the round, don't you? Um, I, am, I work for the EU IPO and we don't use disclaimers anymore. They've ta taken it out. Personally, I don't agree. <laughs> um, um, I come from Finland. In Finland, we, at least in a few years back, we always had disclaimers. I thought it was a fantastic <coughs> system, and I still think it is. Lots of problems would have, would, have been, would have been solved with disclaimers, especially when you come into likelihood of confusion. If you have it absolutely clear, that this mark, for example, only concerns the way that it has been written or the logo type or whatever, but the word itself is not protected and we don't even want to protect it. Lots of likelihood of confusion cases would have been solved by, simply by that. So I've never really understood this and, and this concern, that the, the fact that the consumer doesn't see it, well, they can still use the trademark anyway, and they actually will use the trademark, even though they don't get it on the register. So I th think that the, the whole idea of the disclaimer is actually to work to help out the registry itself. But what can we have on register? What can we not have on register? How, when do we have like a conclusion or not? Because then the reality of the marketplace is that whatever we say, they can still use it, and they often will. But if, if the word is sung or, or set to three notes, is that then registrable as, as a mark, the combination of the word and the music? Well, it's registered as a mark. Right. And see, if you don't have disclaimers, then you ask whether anything is confusingly similar. And if it is, it's an infringement. If you have a disclaimer, I mean, it's, it's, it's gone back in trademark law for such a long time. If you think the very first Trademarks Act allowed you to register a signature, John Smith. Well, that didn't give him a monopoly, least I, the judges in those days would give him a monopoly against every other John Smith. Although every other John Smith is actually confusingly similar. And that's why, pretty soon enough, they brought in a system of declaimers, which got too elaborate at the time. But... The concept that you should be able to register something narrowly, which is what you're doing with a disclaimer, is something which is missing, and I think we should bring it back. I think <coughs> there is a big advantage to disclaimers if the owner remembers they're there, or when their advisors are asked by perhaps an uh, overzealous marketing department to stamp on somebody, they can say, no, you can't do it because there's this disclaimer and you're going to be laughed out of court. And I think from that point of view, to define to the owner the scope of their protection, it's quite helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the British sort of view with narrowing rights. Um, use. The Americans require you 
to have use and to prove it every now and then if you want to keep the mark. European law is still not entirely clear. I think if a man wrote to the, your office and said, I wish to register this trademark in all classes, I pay the fees, I'm mad enough to pay them all, I wish to make it absolutely plain to the office, I have no intention of using this mark. What would you do? <laughs> so the, the description of the mark is that we're actually not going to use this. Yes, he actually writes it in his letter, I'm not going to use it. Yeah. Um, well, there's not much we can do about it, I think. We have to allow it anyway. I'm, I was just going to tell you that, that in fact, uh, when I started in the office in 1995, well, in 1996, when we got the first applications, one of them came, I think, from Toyota, which was the full list. Of full all, 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 all classes. Yeah. And um, uh, there was the practical problem that at those times everything was sent in by fax, so the, there was a poor secretary who had to write out that whole list into <laughs> our system. But, uh, no, I mean, it's the system we have. <coughs> After five, because of course, the, the argument is that, okay, you don't know what you're going to do within the next five years. You might want to have interest in everything. Toyota is a big company. They can do anything under the sun. So they, they have the interest in protecting it everything, uh, for everything. And of course, then, well, in five years, we'll see whether they've actually do that or not, because then they have to prove the use. But, so, I mean, it, it, there's a reason for it. I also understand the American system, but I'm, I don't really see the value of those statements that they have to give that we are going to use it. Well, yeah, right. We'll see. So, um, well, I have to say, we found it quite valuable hmm. under our old law, because you did have to say you used or intended to use. And, and let me just go a bit further. Let's supposing after four and a half years, Toyota say, well, we'll register it again. So you needn't worry about the first one. Yeah, that's, that's the problem that we have coming up in, in the case that we're going to have the oral hearing. Yes. Yeah. What, what I can tell you is that when we have trademarks registered for a long <coughs> list of classes and for all um, products and services uh, of those classes, those trademarks are very uh, difficult to defend when the, the absence of serious use uh, is invoked. Oh, after, after yes, the, if it's under attack. Yes, yes. yes. But yes. What, ha what do you do if before the five years is up, they apply for it all over again, starting a new five-year period? Nothing? How do you stop them? That's what happens now. If you've got the money to do oodles of rolling registrations for a whole series of I think it's one of the points in the Sky case going... going it's it's uh, exactly the problem in the Sky case. Well, I hope the court has enough sense to say we find a way of doing something. I did, sorry, I did find in the Assos case one of the most difficult things and one of the, one of the areas in which the Court of Appeal quite rightly felt that I had tripped up was in working out at which stages one has to use a test based on fair notional use and of which stages you were entitled to look at the use that had actually been made. And the sense that I had, and I was also looking at a case that you had done about the surfing clothes for young people as opposed to the elegant clothes for middle-aged women. Um, and what one came up against was the, the, the inadequacies in English which may not be the same inadequacies in other languages, of describing subsets of these very general classes of clothing, headgear and footwear, which cover huge numbers of things, which can be described individually, but there's no commonly used language, really, for describing clear subsets of them and there seemed to me to be a very big gap between the ability to strike out the mark for non-use and yet the breadth of the fair notional use being actually much much wider than any use that the company had actually made of the mark or whether they were able to provide any evidence at all that they were going to expand into the vast it seemed to me, area of fair notional use which couldn't be cut back by a challenge to validity for non-use. And I found that quite...
quite a kind of puzzling aspect of the protection that was was provided. Have you come across this one at all? Um, no, not so recently. Maybe actually, you've I have had a case. But no, I have, I have actually, but, but, but I have because I had to um, adjourn out a, a case because it was exactly on the same issues that the Skykick reference was right. made. Um, so, and that was in IPEC. Um, uh, it was entirely on the issues of, of bad faith and, and um, l lack of precision in specification. Uh, so, uh, but a lot of those cases are, are being adjourned out, and so we're not seeing them at the moment. I think there was a non-use case which David Newberger did, and he said you can't dig deeper. And I, I said to somebody, you, you can, you must, if you have a registration for containers. That includes waste paper baskets, hold alls, snuff boxes. <laughs> to say they're all the same thing because they all fit the word container, seems to me to be mad. Uh, well, we and you're right, that's, it, it's because the English language is not very good at dividing things up. That's another point in, in, in Sky, isn't it? Com computer programs. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you all, do you think trademarks has got too complicated? We're complicated beings, aren't we? We make complexities if we think it'll be in our commercial advantage. Um, Some of them, yes. Some of them not. I mean, trademark law. Yes. It does seem to me to be a complicated way of dealing with, with, with what is, at base, quite a simple thing. Are people likely to be confused that something that they're looking at and might want to buy has been made by somebody else? Um, and around that, what you would think is a fairly simple problem, uh, has grown this hugely complicated series of tests. I know it's, it's not just that because you have the free riding and um, dilution aspects as well and tarnishment, but um, that still is the, the basis of it. But it's the way that it, how it integrates with passing off at various stages, I did find complicated. I'm sure you, you it's part of your daily diet and so you, you don't recognise perhaps the complexities of it. But I think for a judge coming to it afresh, I think it is, it is a complex area. It's, it's, it's certainly a complex area and, and, and that's why I think uh, we who work in this area, when we come into it, we never go out. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you become a trademark lawyer, you will always be a trademark lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but one of the reasons is because it's very interesting. Uh, it's very difficult sometimes. Um, and, uh, but whether it has become more difficult, I don't think so. But the, these same problems that we have now, we already had them 20 years ago when we started our office. I mean, the legal questions are more or less the same. There, there's small variations which have come up during the years, but basically we're do, still doing the ex exactly the same thing that we were doing 20 years ago. So it is a, it's a complex area. I don't think it has become more complex, but it's a complex area which is very interesting and stimulating. My, when I was appointed a judge, the, the English practice is that somebody makes a speech to you. My, the speech to me was made by my former pupil master. And one of the things that he begged me not to do was to decide what a trademark is or is for, because this kept lawyers it busy. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe that's the truth. That you're never going to get to the bottom of this. I, I did say that there, somewhere that it's a bit like quantum mechanics, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. The more you're certain about one bit of trademark law, the less you're certain about another bit. <laughs> yes. yes, but it depends if you like or not. The, to, to quote some very well-known uh, lyrics, uh, this could be heaven or this could be hell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For, for those who, who, <laughs> <laughs> who like trademark um, uh, Cases, yes, it's, it's interesting and it's um, challenging to. Do you apply. like trademark yes, cases? Yes, I, I confessed before you came. <laughs> <laughs> All right.
I began to, set, began to go off them when I was on the bench. <laughs> but the most, uh, I wanted to say that the most uh, complex uh, trademark cases were uh, the cases where the trademark was in conflict also with copyright, with design, uh, with patent, so uh, yes, it is possible. Yes, well that conflict may get bigger because 3D shape could be refused registration because before, because the sign added substantial value. Yes. Now, any characteristic of any type of sign can trigger refusal, provided it ad ad adds substantial value. Is that going to cause a lot of trouble? As to what that means? I'm, I'm, I really find it difficult to see the situation where this would apply to. I mean, in 3Ds, uh, I understood the theory behind it was that, for example, that if you have a piece of jewellery, what is, what is there, the substantial value, is the form itself. And therefore, it gives substantial value because that's why you buy it. Not because it might have a trademark on it, because jewellery normally doesn't have a trademark on it, except on the package. And that was the idea behind it, which I found logical. Uh, but how this would then come into word marks or, or, or well, perhaps in figurative marks you could say the same, but even then, you, you, you're not, if you're talking about a piece of jewellery as such, as a 3D thing, compared to one which has been drawn, well, as a logo, I, I think it's fine. Uh, then it doesn't add substantial value, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's, it's the trademark. So I don't really see how this is going to, and, and I don't, I must admit, I don't really know where this came from. Why has it been brought in now? Well, let me give you, uh, uh, Chateau Lafitte used to have as its label mm -hmm. paintings done by very famous art. You can get a Chagall, I forget which year it was, and it's Picasso. Now then, could they register that as a trademark? Would somebody say, oh, no, 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 it's the label, which is adding the substantial value, not... It is the... Because hmm? it's a Picasso. But wouldn't you be able to say that, basically, of uh, Roland, I think, brought it up earlier, that if you put uh, just a Louis Vuitton uh, trademark on, on the product, that already brings uh, substantial well, value. Well, that's... This so is a sort of extra substantial value. I mean, there's a difference between two wines, one of which has got a label by Magritte and one which has got a label by me. But is the substantial value really in the label? Um, it isn't the Chagall on the label because of the quality of the wine in the bottle? No, I mean, it's, 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 it's on there because they paid him a lot of money to do it. Well, exactly, which they wouldn't do if they were... I mean, he could produce a lot of things with the so-called oh. image rights and things. Mm. Say, well, I'm sorry, this, well, is, this is valuable because it's, it's the image of David, David Beckham. So it has substantial value to what otherwise is just an ordinary football. You've got some troubles coming. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> They'll come to you later. Uh, yes, I, I'm very curious w which other characteristic than, than uh, the shape will be invoked. Uh, mm. in, uh, no, I mean, we, we had um, this, uh, concerning the substantial value, we had the case concerning uh, a loudspeaker. Which yeah. we originally, Theodore. yeah, we we originally refused it because uh, we found simply that it's not distinctive. It went all the way up to court, up to the court, and the court said that yes, it is distinctive. That that it is especially because of the special specific design it had, and so on. So then it came back to us, and as we hadn't used this uh, substantial value um, argument, and we actually. Reading the decision of the court, I think the court more or less said directly that it, this is exactly why why it's distinctive because of the shape it has. It has substantial value, so we refused it again. <laughs> and if I'm not totally mistaken, that's their way it stopped because um, in the end it didn't go in the register. And they gave up. And they gave up. Hmm. Good thing too, in my opinion. <laughs> well done. Nice design, though. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> <High> substantial value. <laughs> and then everything you can be on oh, no, is like that. Um, what else have we got here? How did you get into doing trademarks? 
I mean, you were, you were, you were ju you're judge in Romania doing all, probably all sorts of different things. You, you took me by surprise, but I, I, can't, I think I remember. <laughs> I thought you it would. was a very long time ago. Uh, I was dealing with the civil cases uh, at the county court. This was the second level in, in Romania. It's not the first instance court, it's the second one. And one day the, the president of the court um, came to my office and said, uh, do you want to, to participate in a seminar in, uh, in the Netherlands at the Benelux uh, trademark office? I said, I would like to, but I, ha I have no idea about trademarks. Okay, you have two weeks to prepare. You have to, to know by heart the Romanian law uh, and uh, to be able to at least uh, to, to, to participate uh, at a certain level to the debates. I was frightened, but... <laughs> Uh, that seminar was actually very, very well um, conceived. Uh, it was very in intensive. There were only judges coming from uh, Eastern and the Central European countries who, who were not exposed before to this uh, field of law. And when I came back, I told her to the president, look, I don't know how many cases we have in, in trademarks, but please give me all of them. <laughs> <laughs> And he, he did it, and um, uh, in a while I've become so-called specialized judge in, in trademarks and intellectual property in general. But the, the, the most important thing is that in a few years, when I um, became a judge in the Court of Appeal, I've succeeded to convince um, the president at that time to create a special section for intellectual property uh, at the Court of Appeal of Bucharest, and he did it. And for a while, for, for a few years, there were two, only two panels of three judges specialized in IP cases. And we dealt with all IP cases. And this way, we started to have a sort of specialization to, to create. Uh, the same thing happened at the High Court of Justice. Uh, there were um, created two panels of three uh, specialized in IP cases. And uh, that's the story, actually. I would just tell you an extra story about her, why she's here, in fact. Um, she started turning up as one of the judges at the Patent Judges Symposium. And most of the non-patent countries, the judges say very little and make no impression. But we all spotted that Octavia is something else. She innately understands IP. Can't help it. Born that way. Um, and Indeed, when she asked us to start a, a mooch competition in Romania, it was because it was she who was asking that I went with, with a bunch of the Dutch to do a mock trial about something which um, w was for splitting manure on fields. I <laughs> <laughs> Or about a screw invented by Judge Grabinski. That <laughs> <laughs> was another one. That was another one. <laughs> yes, it's true. Uh, James, you've been to one of those. Are they still going on? Those, yes, those, they yes, are. Yes, yes, I invited them again. Good. In a while, you couldn't come. You no. are traveling around the world. <laughs> As you noticed. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm happy that we meet again here today. Well, I'm very thank glad you came. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I've got another question for you. I mean, you, you, you said last year, well, no, you're too soon on the court to come. Um, what was your experience of going to that court? Did you, was it a shock to you compared with what you've been doing in Romania, or was it dead easy? Uh, yes and no. Um, it, it was um, more or less the same thing when it comes to uh, substantial law more or less uh, with the procedural aspects because the, the, the way the, the, the rules of procedure in the general court, um, so the model was the French one, the Romanian was the same more or less. But what was uh, indeed very interesting was that the combination of uh, different um, uh, mentalities, uh, judges coming from different uh, systems of law, uh, the differences between the, the, the judges coming from common law system and continental uh, sometimes are, are very um, difficult to accommodate. Uh, the language system is also very, very interesting because it is very likely that you, you have in an oral hearing 
uh, a language of the procedure and then the judge is asking in other languages if they, they speak better French they, they ask in French or uh, in English or they are allowed even to ask questions in their own native languages and uh, yes it's, it's interesting to, to work there and um, uh, I was for example used to have a huge civil procedure code with all kind of very precise rules here the rules of proceedings is very very uh, short in comparison with the, the national one and we always when we, we don't have a specific uh, regulation we have to discuss and to to compare our different um, uh, national systems and to find the most appropriate one uh, applicable and then to be careful to follow the same in the, in the next cases so here is the, the biggest challenge I think mm -hmm. we are coming from very we, we think we, we we are coming from very secure fields and here it's something where you always have to uh, invent, to adapt, to improve, to it's a, it's a very moving uh, system. At the same time, um, that if you read uh, our, our judgments, they are more or less all alike. You cannot detect that behind there is a certain judge or, or a certain, no, or a certain... I think that, that the absence of, of style is the style. <laughs> 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 and uh, we make huge efforts to have this standardization of our uh, judgments. I don't know if it's good or wrong, but that's it. Melissa, you are about innate. Some people, I think, get IP and some people don't. You do. And you came to us. That's IP. the highest praise I've had for several <laughs> decades. <laughs> but, but you do. Uh, you, and, and so. And, you know, you like doing it. It's quite obvious you like doing it. Um, how did you drift into doing a bit of IP? Well, I didn't drift. I, I, I'm a solicitor. I used to work with Roland here. Um, I qualified into IP. Oh, you did? So um, you but did. I was very much copyright, uh, media, IT. I'm a, I'm a techie person more. Uh, and uh, Roland was there to do trademarks, so I did very little of them. Um, but as a judge, I, I drifted back into IP, if you like, because... Um, uh, Mr. Justice Arnold needed somebody to set up the IPEX Small Claims track, and he looked around, and I was there uh, in the right building um, with a bit of time on my hands. Uh, and so I helped do that, and then from that, I've, I've started sitting in IPEC and, and doing a little bit more. But I'm still only doing about four or five weeks a year because I do have quite a big job that keeps, keeps, keeps me busy elsewhere, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. And Vivian, you. Well, I'm still a dabbler in this uh, field, I yeah. think. Um, as I mentioned earlier, my specialism when I was in practice uh, was in competition law. Um, and so the contact I had with uh, IP was uh, partly in free movement cases when there was a free movement aspect to a claim which was broadly a competition law claim, and I came across it uh, a bit uh, during that, and of course, when I was the editor of Bellamy and Child, there was always quite a substantial yeah. section on technology transfer and, and free movement. Um, and then when I joined the Chancery Division, of course, there are the, the three specialist patent judges, but um, everyone has to turn their hand yeah. at uh, other IP cases if, if, they, if they come along. And fortunately for me, some interesting ones did come into my... Um, come into my list. Well, you might be turning your hand to patents in the Court of Appeal after <laughs> January. <laughs> <laughs> Since the Court of Appeal is one down at the yes. moment. Yes. Well, um. I will sit quietly if that's the case for the first couple at least, and then <laughs> probably start with <coughs> yeah, That's my uh, general modus. Yes, <laughs> keep your head down. That's what I was advised when I went on the bench. Keep your head down for six months. Nobody can remember that six months when I kept my head down. <laughs> I'm sure it never happened. Did you? <laughs> but it's interesting the point about the, the judgment writing and the, 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 the absence of style being the, the general court style, which I think is uh, obviously I mostly read cases <coughs> on, on all sorts of topics, uh, and that's certainly the case, which is, of course, very different from. Um, the style in our courts where I think anybody would guess who the author of, of a Mr. Justice or Lord Justice Jacob um, judgment without seeing the name. Um, yes. There are some judges who 
delight in having a distinctive style and certainly it's one of the great pleasures of the job is, is constructing an interesting judgment, I find. Mm. Yes? No, I mean, you're stuck in trademarks, so you've never touched any other IP rights? Um, or did you once? Does well, in fact, uh, my first job as a lawyer was a corp. I was a corporate lawyer in a construction company, and it was incredibly boring. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously, I hated the job, <laughs> and I thought, how am I going to get out of this? And and then through a, li a few different steps, uh, I I got into a law firm where I was working with what. The person who in Finland we call the grand dame of trademarks, and Mrs. Tomila, and she is the one who really got me into it. And then I'd only been with them for about a year or so, and uh, Finland joined the EU, and I read an article about an office that they're going to put for trademarks, and I said, "Well, that would be interesting." <laughs> and then I said, "Well, where are they going to put it up?" <laughs> oh, Alicante. Oh, what an horrible place! I mean, seriously, for somebody coming from the Nordic countries where it's always dark and rainy and so on. God. <laughs> so it was like, you know, that's where I'm going. I don't care how, but I'm going there. And I sent a letter and I, and I said, look, I'd noticed they, they had actually published a couple of posts for the first members of the Boards of Appeal. I didn't have the, the experience at the time. So I sent a letter and said, look, I want to come and work, work there. Are you going to publish any posts? About it? And they said, well, send in your CV. Because for some reason, I didn't add my CV into it. <laughs> and uh, so that's where I went. Um, and I must say that really the work of, I mean, when you work in a law firm, which is, even though you're working some case on trademarks, your course works different kinds of things. When you go into a work in an office, you work on trademarks every single day, on different cases every single day. You learn a lot in, in a couple of months. Yes. Uh, and, 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 and during the years, of course, more and more. So I often say to people that even though you might be interested in going into the private sector, which of course is fantastic as well, I loved being a lawyer in a law firm. I thought it was great. It was like being in L.A. law. <laughs> the ambience was a bit the same. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so, uh, but in any case, if you really want to learn it, you should first start off in an office because there you work with it all the time and you, you see different kinds of cases and you get a, an, a, an incredible amount of experience in a very short time. Well, I see it's quarter past. And as I came in a bit late, I could see all the drinks sitting outside. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the time has come to thank this marvellous group. And I'm sorry I wasn't here because I wanted to hear what they had to say. And they must have had to say more and go out and have a drink or two.